Hello and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 27th of September 2023. Coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7URP. Lovely to see you on tonight's show. We welcome Nick G3RWF who will be telling us how to make a cheap, light and compact HF beam. We look back with video and pictures from a couple of events earlier this month. And we find out what on earth this is. Now I can exclusively reveal, I know we've been away, but we've only had one entry for this, whereas sometimes I get so many I have to use another sheet of paper in the script. Just one entry. So if you think you know what that is, and the only clue I'm gonna give you is not totally unrelated to our hobby. That's all. So, you know, electronics related, certainly. If you know what that is, and you haven't already emailed us, and only one person did, then drop it on a message on uh, BATC or Facebook. Don't email us now. Uh, and then we'll, we'll include you when we read out the only answer so far. Go on, you could win. But I'm afraid that we start with sad news. And we're very sad to inform you of the death of NARC member Rodney Sparrow, M7PWL, who died on the 7th of September. He joined our club a few years ago and was going to take his foundation course with us in 2020, but this was cancelled because of COVID. And so I don't think many of us knew him well personally, though looking back at emails from him, he enjoyed and interacted through NARC Live. I'm afraid we don't have a picture of him, but his friend Mike M0TVG wrote and told me that he and his wife Jean have been friends with Rod and his wife Gail for some years now. Mike says that he particularly admired Rod's technical knowledge and skills in electronics, including his ability to restore vintage radios. Rod was truly a gentleman and a privilege to know, Mike added. We've sent a card to the family, and if you'd like details of the funeral, please email me. <clears throat> Rodney Sparrow, M7PWL, now sadly silent key. Now we move on to club news. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. And we start with uh, news of uh, probably the last main event, outside event anyway, this summer, <coughs> this year. Um, because we have a summer fox hunt this Sunday, the 1st of October. A lot of people said, why can't we have another one? Because we enjoy it so much and we've had two already this year. Uh, but this is just for fun and it has got an interesting twist to it. That's all I can say. But it does start from... 10 a.m. on Thorpe Recreation Ground, which is where we usually run these now, on the usual two meter frequency of 145.225 megahertz, and we're using Land Ranger Map 134. I've given that frequency because you can, of course, listen to this, but although please, please don't transmit. You can maybe help us keep the frequency clear, though. The Fox will be transmitting every five minutes for one minute. Um, but in case somebody comes in and tries to use the frequency, you could help us clearly clear. But, but do listen if you'd like to. See if you can work out where we are. Now, there's a rather different mystery fox team, I can tell you. And uh, eventually, um, everybody will be going for a traditional Sunday lunch at about 1 o'clock. But it starts at 10 a.m. and we will finish at about 12, maybe 12.30 at the latest, the actual race. And you don't have to go to the lunch if you don't want to. But if you're entering a team, the key thing is please email me tonight or by tomorrow, the absolute latest. And then we'll make you up an envelope and we'll book you places for the optional lunch if you'd like us to save you spaces there. Being a Sunday, it's going to be quite busy for Sunday lunch. So that's the Summer Fox Hunt, the very last one of the year, this Sunday, the 1st of October, with an interesting twist on it. Now, earlier in this month, um, we, had, uh, we were very busy, if you remember, with lots of other events. Um, we had two field day stations, one here at DCP, for SSB Field Day. And we also had for the first time a serious big entry for the VHF contest station at Trimmingham on the 2nd of 3rd of September. We did show a couple of still pictures of these earlier, but we've also been sent um, a video and some other pictures, thanks to Phil G4LPP, Mark G0TMT and some others. Um, but anyway, let's roll VT as they say, Tammy, please. I should add that this is at Trimmingham, which is on the North Norfolk coast. 
was famous at least for its big round golf ball type radar until recently. And the Bitten group, who normally use this site, very kindly let us use it because they weren't doing this particular competition, although several of them members came and took part. I like the music, Tammy. I'm tapping my foot here. I hope you are at home as well. So there's a great camaraderie, great event. This is a, a video. I think Mark might have taken this with a drone. But anyway, whoever did, thank you very much. Look at that. Two big masts and antennas because this was a European contest. Yeehaw! Is that appropriate? No. All right then. Work your partners on this contest. I bet they did transmit when they were doing this on the drone. <laughs> see, I think that was a drone operator. I'm, I'm trying to see who that was. It is a stunning place to operate from, both visually and also, I'm assured, technically as well. Anyway, many thanks to uh, Phil for sharing those with us and to all of those who contributed to that video. Thanks very much. Now, another thing that we did earlier this month, in fact, the, the weekend after, because again, you asked for another radio by the seaside. Because our first one wasn't brilliant weather, I seem to remember, but this one was stunning. It was on the 10th of September and I got pictures of most of you there. So let's have a look at some of those. Oh, there's some wily lots here, aren't there? And it wasn't completely optional to actually run radio, but several of you did. I was really pleased to see. It's Colin and Jeff there. Oh, look at this. And there's a really, it's a basic stuff as well. Most people, I think that's a 705 there, possibly. It's got, David's got there. There's Jim Bacon and his brother, Dick, putting up, um, well, it looks like a... <laughs> Half a tent. <laughs> I was going to say half a tent or maybe even a, um, uh, what do you call it, kite. But oh, no, God. that was a shelter that we saw, Jim. And of course, being a weatherman, he told us that the weather was going to be good. And it was really hot that day. So I think that's why they put these shades up. Very, very hot, in mm. fact. Oh, it's yeah. a real Indian summer. I don't think it's an Indian summer unless you've Isn't had it? frost. Is that, I think? That's Kevin there. Like, um, I'm sure people are I don't much know. wiser It's nice to see, that. by the way, members of... Joint man, Kevin is a member of our club, but he's also from King's Lynn Club as well. So it's a great time to bring everybody together, really. It doesn't matter who you... He's got his frying pan in his And a great pan. advert for HP Sauce. <laughs> oh, there's a Summer the Summer gang, Summer Wine gang. Right in there as well. So as you can see, hopefully from these pictures, it was a stunning day of weather and lots of aerials. Put up all around there. Oh, oh, wh why is there oh sorry, oh, that must have slipped in by mistake, Tammy, when I sent them to your computer earlier. Oh dear, there's a train at North Norfolk. That's a class 14. You knew that though, didn't you? Mm, of course. Very unusual. Nice okay. to see that and hear that. Just as happens to have made the <laughs> shot. Anyway, thanks very much uh, to everybody who supported that second Radio by the Seaside. And there's nothing wrong with us doing more than one a year. So if you want one again next year, then we'll, we'll uh, more than one, we'll do that as well. Now on to members news. And uh, not much from you actually so far, uh, but uh, Bob G6 PWS sent us these couple of pictures. Now he says this shows his sister's village on the left, about halfway up the clump of houses where his sister lives. My goodness me. Do you think Look I've got that. the pictures the wrong I way around? I don't know, because it wasn't really clear <laughs> oh, okay. which one, which was which. But anyway, on the right hand side is the fish key, and on the right from the key you can make out the Kulag hotel which is the only oh, yeah. bar in the village. I'm definitely on the wrong picture. All right sorry that one then. Uh, my sister's boyfriend is a paramedic and as such when a patient needs urgent treatment they organized a helicopter from Inverness and as he was dealing with the person he had to go to Inverness with them. Of course he had his camera with him and he's and these are from his camera. Taking off at Drumbeg uh, came over Loch uh, Shan uh, looking towards Karlsgoo bridge my goodness I'm not very good at this you should have done this Tammy then <laughs> dropped down the coast and took great pictures of Lochinver village 
and the lock inver entrance. Unfortunately, once he was delivered to Inverness Infirmary, he had to get a taxi back home. Oh, that's not as good, is it? It's a helicopter. Uh, and that, which cost £72, but of course the service paid for that as well. But anyway, cool. that was uh, we'll lovely pictures. The picture there, Thank it? you to Bob and, uh, well, his sister's boyfriend who took those pictures. They're Lovely, stunning, aren't they? they? Mm. Really wonderful. Now, with a, if you'll excuse a little bit of self-indulgence, we don't normally feature our own news, but we didn't have uh, anything else from other people. And also, we have just been on holiday for two weeks on a cruise to Iceland and also the Faroe Islands at the end. And we thought we would share this with a couple of pictures with you, which are a bit different. And also because it's shock radio horror, related. it's radio related. Dun, dun, dun. Even though I was on holiday, that's uh, me in our cabin. We were should just share with you as well. We we booked a regular cabin with a window, but then they phoned us a week before and offered us such a good deal on a on a cabin with a balcony that we took it. And of course, having a balcony meant that we maybe could do a bit of radio. So that's me with my IC705. Kevin let me a lovely battery set up there, just a literally battery. He said, you won't need to charge that if you take that with you. And he was right. That's a pretty heavy battery, bigger than the radio itself. And I did make to manage to make contact on the Koblenz sked, which was on the Saturday. We went on the Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. And um, yeah, I made contact on the Koblenz sked, <coughs> which really shocked Malcolm. Because yeah. he, he could only just make me out. But I should tell you, this only runs 10 watts. And the antenna, which I'm going to show you pictures of. Actually, can we show the pictures yep. now? This, I, by the way, first thing, I'm sure you know this. If you've got a license, you should know it. If you ever want to work maritime mobile, you first you have to ask the captain of the ship. And that's what I did. And within 24 hours, I got a message back saying that he was happy that I operated. I'd just tell them what radio, what bands I might be on and what power. And he was happy. And this is a fantastic... Um, this is genuinely for interest for anybody who wants to work portable, if you don't already know. This is Sota Beams, make this compact antenna. I said to Kevin, I need something relatively light, although there are no real weight limits on a cruise, um, but it needs to be quite small. This folds down to just over two feet. It's fiberglass, it's got several sections that goes up to 7.1 meters. And it was the strongest, smallest compact thing that he could find me. I just put up a simple bit of antenna wire no, not tuned to any particular length, Sim simple seven strand 0 0.2 wire that fed into the tuner for the um, 705, which is, is excellent, I must say. It does tune anything, as people do often say, including a bit of wire literally put in with a four millimeter plug into it. And as I said, I managed to contact, uh, make contact in the Koblenzke that on the Saturday morning, which really shocked Malcolm when he heard my my voice very much in the distance he said but he got it and we had a quick conversation i did enter the skid nobody in germany could hear it either which no. was a bit odd but um, anyway it's good to make that i also worked kevin and also a gentleman called martin who was um uh in poland hmm. a sugar queen station uh, and um and these were on 20 meters by the way so the uh, I'm trying to think of the frequency of the Koblenz skid. 7.123. Yeah. That's right. You're yeah, good, Tammy. Yeah, yeah. You're good. <laughs> um, anyway, just quickly, again, this is, we're not trying to indulge you on all our holiday pictures here, but we want to show you this next picture. because Do we? Well, because um, it was, some of the weather was a bit rough, as you could see, and I was a bit worried by when I wasn't getting Kevin, <laughs> when I tried to make contact with him and some predefined skids. It was trying to insulate the wire from touching any of the metal. And of course, these things are all made of metal, these ships. So we opened the door and I needed to insulate the wire. Tammy didn't fancy holding the wire, even though it was only running at 10 watts and was insulated. So she, we made this improvised thing with a tie wrap and she tell us Tammy holding it. There. Yeah, you need to take reusable tie wraps if you go on holiday. <laughs> yeah, they're very, very useful. We even lent one to the band, didn't yeah. we? For, to, for, anyway, for a different reason. Um, and there, this... This next picture just shows you the tuner unit. So if you have a 705, you might have bought one of these and it is cracking. You just see the antenna plugged in the top with a four mil plug. Anyway, we will now indulge you with a couple of... Yeah, seconds. this is proof that it wasn't all radio not. related. On That's right. Holiday. This is yeah. inside a, a lava, lava tunnel. tunnel. Yeah. Uh, in uh, um, Reykjavik. Yeah. And uh, that was a wonderful tour that we did that day. And, and there's some of the things on the dun, left. Dun, Look dun. at this, the fake yeah. shapes. And then what else we didn't expect to have to see this, but Jim, when I saw Jim at the seaside event a few days before, Jim Bacon, G3 YLA, he said to me, you know what, you might see a bit of Northern Lights. We did. And see he Northern was right, because that was stunning. And as if, if you've ever seen these, and I know you had some in Norfolk as well, you had good conditions for that. 
Um, you can't normally, sometimes you can't even see them at all with your did, human eye. Uh, to be fair, just so people can see comparison, this photo I actually took on my mobile phone on a long right. exposure. So, and then this next one I took on the camera, the proper camera. The Sony Alpha 7, yep. which is one of the cameras that's got light, light, light. So that, I don't think they're hardly distinguishable. Can you flick back again? It's a me? bit more blurred, the other one there. Yeah. But it could be, because we're at sea at this point, so it could have been partly to do with that. And there's uh, Reykjavik in the background. Yeah, we just left Reykjavik then. Anyway, that is go. it. We feel really self-indulgent sharing those with you, but we thought we would because it was radio-related. Thank you very much. Some of it was. Too boy. All right. Tammy, little people, what okay. have you got for little us? Little people, yeah. Well, uh, there was lots of things funny in the studio when we got back, so I wonder what would happen then. <gasps> this is what happened while we were on holiday. Is that our mixer? Oh, cool. There you go. Sitting on the phone. They went on holiday too. They did. Look at that. Brilliant. Miniature-calendar.com, a new picture every day, and this fantastic Japanese website, and Tammy picks one for us every night live. That is really good, isn't it? So keep in touch with what you've been doing. I know that lots of holiday snaps might be boring to others, but especially relevant ones, or they don't have to be radio related. It's just a way of keeping club members in touch with each other and send them to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. And if you get them to us by three o'clock at the latest on the Wednesday of Night Live, we normally include them on that program. So thanks very much. Um, yeah, I've had a few comments as well about those things here. Um, Paul G3VPT says, don't tell Roger you didn't use CW. <laughs> you saw the mic, did you? <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that. I've probably been told off for that. Um, anyway, let's now look uh, at the competition that we set you two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, sorry, actually. Yeah. And when we asked you, what on earth is this? Now, have we had any entries tonight? Oh, yes, and we, we have, have had one, one, entry. one guess. Okay, any others? No, all right. So the one who personally wrote into us was NevM0NFY and says that it looks like a slate roof tile repair bracket to me, sometimes called a tingle, which I thought was something completely different. <laughs> we better not talk about that. But anyway, that's what Paul said. And what, what does Simon M0SIH on BATC says? I think the item is an adapter for a hot air heat gun yeah i get that oh, yeah yeah you curls the heat at the bottom curl, don't yeah around yeah. the heat stream good <coughs> at, good guess simon but not right yeah i'm sorry to tell you because the answer is it's a cage nut install extraction tool and this picture which uh, by the way mark g0gaj sent this this competition shows us how it's used and if you've ever done anything with a, a 19 inch rack which is most of the standard rack sizes of that, and tried to fit one of these nuts, which I have with racks here, but you try taking them out, they are difficult. They're quite difficult to get in, but quite possible if you've got reasonably long nails, but you try and get them out. And anyway, this is what this tool does. So I might get one of those as well now. Another excuse to buy something, tell me. Yep. Is that all right? Okay, so anyway, thank you very much, Mark, for entering that and for fooling nearly everybody. Well, everybody, actually. You fooled everybody what it was, because I haven't seen one of those before either. Anyway, thank you very much for that. Now let's have a look at the next What on Earth. And will more of you know what this is when I ask, what on earth is this? No clues. I get hit if I get clues. Look at that. Now that is, well, it is fair just to say it's hobby related. That's all I'll say. What on earth is that fantastic looking thing? can't wait to tell that you. It looks actually. pretty wicked. It does actually, yeah. You just, you so want it to be a pastry car. <laughs> Do you? Can well, you make really cool cookies with that, couldn't you? Yeah. Anyway, have a close look. As usual, we'll put this on our Facebook page, we'll put it on to our newsletter and on the website. And you've got just under two weeks to let us know what that is, because we'll be back here in two weeks time. You let us know by three o'clock at the latest that day. But if you know what it is now, just drop us that email to that address, radio at dcpmicro.com. And um, well, good luck. Lovely one, that. So, uh, as I said, thank you very much indeed for all those entries. Also, just want to show you our card as well. Remind you that if you'd like to send this card to anybody, maybe someone who needs cheering up um, or congratulate someone, a birthday or celebration of some kind, just send their address uh, to us, name and address to us, and we will add your name to ours and send it off. Send it to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com as always. Address for anything for NARC Live. 
Now, just quickly time to tell you what's happening at the club this coming week before we meet tonight's guest. Um, on Sunday at 7 o'clock, it's the GB2RS News on GB3MB. On Monday at half past seven, it's the Monday Night Net on GB3MB as well. And at, at uh, eight o'clock, it's the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. Then next Wednesday, a week tonight, on October the 4th, we've got a social and bright sparks for our younger members at when we meet at CNS School between seven and 9.30. So it's a real meeting in person next uh, Wednesday. I hope you'll join us there. And if not, we'll be back here with NARC Live in two weeks tonight on the 11th of October with a talk on the Sable Island de-expedition with Glenn W0GJ coming to us live from the States. So that's what's happening two weeks time on Night Live. In the meantime, as I said, please send us your stories, your pictures, keep in touch. Uh, if you've got any pictures for mystery objects <coughs> around, as I said before, please do send them. See if we can fox our audience. Send them to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. Now we're on to our main event um, and uh, I remember that we've had tonight's guest. We met him before when we were meeting every week at the school. He came to see us once, um, I think as, in his capacity as RSGB president. But tonight he's here to tell us how to make a cheap, light and compact HF beam. So it's a real pleasure to welcome back Nick G3RWF. Nick. Thanks very much, David and, uh, and Tammy and very good evening to, uh, to everybody. It's really, uh, really good to be here. Lovely and, to um, see you as well. Absolutely lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Do you remember visiting I, I, us a few, several years ago now at the school in Norwich? I came, twi I came twice, actually. Did you? So, uh, yeah, so obviously it wasn't that memorable. <laughs> well, no, it <laughs> yes, just I, seems a long time, you know, what it's like in the last few years as well, since we've been doing a lot of our talks, or most of them this way now. It does seem a long time, but it's lovely to welcome you back. And, I mean, you saw what, I, what attempt I made to make HF contacts with just a simple piece of wire. I'm sure... The beam That's that you're great. going to talk to us about tonight, though, will, will uh, give us greater, make more of that 10 watts. It would have made more of the 10 watts. I think I might have got, had to get a bit more than permission from the captain to put up a, a rotating beam. But I'm really looking forward to it. I haven't seen what you're going to tell us about tonight either. So as always, to, just to let everybody know at home, if you've got any questions for Nick as we go along or any comments to make or any experiences that you've got with something like this, then don't forget to put them onto BATC or to Facebook. Now over to Nick for his talk on this cheap, light and compact HF beam. Nick. Fine, thank you very much indeed. And uh, yes, I, I do indeed remember my visit to uh, the, Nor the Norfolk Club and I, I came in, in, per in person. I came, I, came, I came twice, in fact. Actually, I, I don't just remember being, being with you. It was a great meet, meeting. It was so, you know, such, a, such a busy and uh, active club. That was, uh, that was a delight. But when I, was, when I was driving back to Kent, which is quite a good haul, um, you very kindly offered to uh, uh, to put me up overnight, but I like sleeping in my own bed. And anyway, you may remember that that was the time when they seemed to be digging up all of the all of the A roads that <laughs> led out of East Anglia, certainly oh. to Kent. And oh I, no! And I and I left and I left the school and I headed off down the road and I my sat nav took me all over the place because every road was closed. Uh, anyway, I eventually found my way onto an onto an A road and it was lit. <laughs> and it was dual carriageway, and uh, so I'm, I'm kind of buzzing along, heading southwards, reasonably happy. And I saw this dark thing under a bridge, and I thought, oh, they've been patching the tarmac. And I got very close to it. I realised it actually was a heap of debris in the road, and the main item was an enormous lorry wheel. Uh, there was a battery and various bits of ironmongery. I slammed on the brakes. I decided to hit the, the wheel uh, head on, so I kind of bounced over the top of it, trying to forget the fact my car was, I think at that stage, about five weeks old. And um, yes, well, oh my uh, goodness. The oh. well, I'm really the sorry. I feel guilty now. Yeah. That no, 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 no. Was... I'm, get, I'm, I'm very slowly getting to the point. <laughs> but the guilty lorry was a few hundred yards further on. It got foreign number plates, and I thought. I'm not going to be standing on this Norfolk road in the middle of the night having a discussion with the police. So uh, I, I just I just drove on. It cost me quite a lot of money. But um, anyway, so that's the, the point I'm making is it's great to be online. Well, <laughs> At least I'm not trying to do that again. <laughs> no, I suppose not. Although it is nice. I mean, we, we do miss seeing people in person. But um, just to give you a bit of background, I think most people watching will know, you know, this was a decision that um, yeah. the members made after 
the pandemic when clearly we couldn't meet and um, they decided yep. that this was a good way for them to see talks and hear talks so it's great he's just worked some magic now and put me on the screen as well and so that's what we do although we say we do miss pe meeting people um in in person uh, to be honest yep. but um Anyway, but I'm really sorry for that you had such much trouble. We have had the A11, which you'll remember is one of the main trunks out of that's Norwich. What, that's that's, what it was, that's yeah. been partially closed for a year for major works, but it has <laughs> just reopened. So if you're thinking of coming up this way again, we, we honestly, we'd love to see people, honestly. We're not trying to make our I, county difficult to get to. But uh, I'm, anyway, it's lovely to, to see you there. tonight. I'd love to be there. Anyway, I've, I've come to talk about a small antenna and... Uh, here it is. Well, let's show you a full screen of, of you probably can't. Now, I think. Well, no, just hold it, hold it still for us, Nick, and we'll go rather than your top side. There we go. All right. Now that is quite small, isn't it? I mean, Ma max maximum length twenty two inches in old money. Right. Uh, and the weight is mixing up my measurements, just over two kilograms. See, Actually, Tammy, about, we could have fitted something. It's like about that five in pounds. Lunch. Oh, yeah, that's it's, good, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is the. Was, this yeah. is the. I haven't, I haven't actually put the tower in the packet, but um, that's the entire antenna. Anyway, no, so I'm going good. to talk. Well, a, I'm going to talk a bit, but then um, I'm going to try and show you how you might want to make one if uh, if that's the way you you want to go. Well, and, in true um, Blue Peter style, we look forward to it. All I right. kind of say I'm I am I'm not a technical genius, and I'm not a uh, I'm I'm not a anything really, uh, except I absolutely love amateur radio. So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we get from there. So bear with me while I have a bit, a bit of a wander around why you might want a lightweight antenna uh, and uh, indeed why, why I wanted one. Well, go back. Some of you will know I uh, have a sort of wanderlust. I've wandered around the place qu quite a lot, foreign countries and so on, doing amateur radio. Um, I sort of retired from... Uh, paid employment in 2001 and I went to uh, to Kenya where I used to live years ago um, and used their club tribander uh, to do uh, to to use my my, my Kenyan license went to, did that a few times the tribander didn't work terribly well because every time I went there was something something had been stolen it was usually the feed cable could be the coax I think the last time I went uh, the last the very last time I went somebody ha hadn't realized that actually it was um, a, a, an American voltage rotator and they plugged it straight into the mains um, so yeah so I've been doing all of it been doing all of that and um, in, after after about 2007 I suppose I, I really got into it and um, I went to Uganda 14 times in the in the next 10 years usually for quite a long stay like a couple of months or so uh, and doing two things which I enjoyed one was working at the local university nothing to do with radio and the other one was being on the air as 5x1 and H and I'm sure I worked quite a lot of you because I worked 120 something thousand QSOs from uh, from Uganda yeah. I always took with me the maximum luggage allowance two 23, 23 kilogram bags and cabin bag at least 10 kilograms as well and I'm sure you'll realize I'm sorry I'm dotting between imperial and metric here but that's the way I am I'm afraid that's quite a quite a, a problem for for a single person or on a single person traveling um so heavy difficult in, in airports particularly where theft's a problem and you might want to have to leave stuff and all that kind of business so even before um the the uh the pandemic, I suppose, I was beginning to think about all of that. And my my final trip before the pandemic was uh, for radio was to Kenya, and uh, uh, that didn't go well. I won't spare you the details, but that kind of tied together with my enthusiasm for lugging all the kit around, waning somewhat. And that actually, as 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 age increased, if I dare mention that, but uh, there we are. That was all before COVID. Well, that probably should have brought to a conclusion my wanderings to Africa. But uh, in last year, 2022, uh, my good mate G3XAQ, who lives not very far from me, and has an irritatingly lovely tower um, with lots of very really nice antennas on it. Uh, he, he said he was going to go to Gambia. And, uh, and I thought about it. I thought, so I said, no. Can I come along as well? So the plan was we'd do a single band low power entry at 100 watts. That's 
quite a lot of power, isn't it, compared with 10 watts from the back of your vessel uh, around, uh, around Iceland. But anyway, he was going to, probably going to be on 20, and I was going to be on, on 10 or 15 last-minute decisions, depending on conditions, of course. Actually, actually, we had done the same thing before in 2013 when he joined me in East Africa and we did 10 metres and 15 metres single band entries from Rwanda and we actually shared the same antenna, usual filters and all that kind of stuff. So there's the problem. Didn't want to take all that stuff. How to go to the Gambia without all that stuff? I've learned over the years that you know, you can have a call which is quite popular for a contest, but if they can't hear you, you'll get very frustrated. I'm sure you, many of you know that expression, and you may hear the other version of it, which is life is too short for QRP, but QRO is jolly heavy. And um, so I had already taken one step as far as that was concerned, and that was I switched from multi band entries in contests to single band entries because that actually allows you um, a reasonable amount of sleep. And why has the... That's my... Uh -uh. My screen's gone to sleep. Why is that? Whoops, there we are. There. Okay. Yeah, it's just a bit of a delay. Well, there you are. That's a less than flattering picture of me taken. That was in Sierra Leone years ago. But uh, I, don't know, I don't know when that was taken, but all I can say... I just get the impression I wasn't totally on the ball regarding operating <laughs> at, that, at, at that particular moment. My, my, so, a similar picture of my wife when I was operating on the ship. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's very unkind, that, really. <laughs> but I've had a screwdriver. That shows I'm really technical. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so, I'd, so I'd simplified down to, to, to a single band, and I'd also realised that it's got to be fairly loud. So that led me to Moxon antennas, now, some of you may be experts in moxons, in which case, apologies, you're going to hear quite a lot in the, the next few minutes. But um, I always think when you hear when you hear things, when you hear a talk about something you you know quite a lot about, there's always the opportunity to just pick up something you hadn't thought of previously, or alternatively thought, hmm, I did it better a better way than that. So, if you're in that category, perhaps you'd take that uh, that kind of approach. So. Um, Moxons, uh, I have used a lot. Uh, two element moxons, they they work. Um, I'll just be a bit of modest boasting. Can you can you be a modest boaster? I'm not too sure really, but um, I did come world first low power single on 15 meters low power from Uganda in 2012 with a world record, mm. no less. It lasted 12 months, unfortunately. Somebody has spotted one of the other thing about. One other thing about contesting, and that is look for the weak spots and go for them. Uh, but unfortunately, you'll find a year later, somebody else will have spotted what you've done and overtake you. Um, I've also managed World First from Rwanda on 15 and also on 20 metres from Uganda, all with homemade moxons, which is the basis of what I'm going to talk. And I owe most of it to G3XAQ. In case he sees this video, I've got to say that, otherwise he'd be really mm -hmm. upset with me. But uh, it's, it's a fair comment. And in case anybody's at all impressed by any of that bragging, um, I'm sure you've probably worked out, if you're in a place where you're the only active station in the country, if you get three points because you're in a different continent for almost every single contact, and you also give multipliers probably because you're the only station in that zone, getting a, a lot of QSOs is not that difficult. But, 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 you do need to be heard. So that gets me back to the, uh, to the to the beam. I hope some of you are still with me. So if those of you are thinking, oh, what's he going on about? I'm not off to foreign parts. My talk is actually about a useful lightweight beam for use anywhere. Two elements are as good as a linear, well, a legal linear, and you can hear the DX far better as well. And the, the other, the final bit of this, before I actually start talking about nuts and bolts and things, is that I don't have a beam at home because I live in a conservation area. So with, I was expecting some more sunspots. They were really buzzing around earlier on this year, weren't they? And they've kind of 
gone quiet or having or having solar storms instead at the moment with your autumn equinox but i wanted something for 10 meters to use at home during sunspot maximum something i could take up and down <coughs> like and the antenna that never was there in my conservation area sadly i now live live alone but i spend quite a lot of a lot of the time with uh, a brother up in the Lake District. So a lightweight portable beam also seems to be a pretty good idea for trips up there from time to time. So for those of you with antenna restrictions, this might be for you. So small and compact, a further twist. Alan and I decided to entertain ourselves before traveling to the Gambia by trying to make as small a two element Moxon as a smaller uh, two element moxon as we possibly could for me that meant something which would go in a suitcase it's becoming increasingly difficult to ship long poles and things abroad they they want to know what's inside your golf bag and they don't believe you when they see a pole because you told them it was a four number four iron or something um i don't understand golf either um so so i went and measured my suitcases and i decided maximum length had to be 22 inches now that is not very long is it really i think i thought i brought myself a tape measure i've dropped it or put it down somewhere but never mind no i've lost it but anyway that's 22 inches yeah um so I, I wanted to see if i could get a 10 meter beam right down to say 22 inches that would actually go in virtually any suitcase um, and that would be a, a vast improvement on some of the stuff I've, uh, I've, I've, I've hauled around from, from time to time. So there we go. Some of you um, may know all about mox moxins, as I, as I mentioned before, and I hope I'm not treating my, teaching my grandmother to suck eggs or grandfathers or whatever you're allowed to say these days. But um, I am going to go a bit through, it's, I'd say manufacture, what I really mean is assembly. Actually, if you've if you've made a K three, you you know what I mean by the difference between assembly and building. But there we are. Also, I'm going to mention where you can get things from time to time, and uh, if you want to ask those questions, that'll be that'll be uh, that'll be fine, of course. Anyway, here we go. So this is the basic this is the basic idea of the beam. You notice the high tech uh, presentation there, um, but I just wanted to. Just, just there's nothing there except the except the the elements at the top, the um, the driven element, uh, which is effectively quarter wave on on either side with the ends turned in, and then it closely coupled um, the reflector, obviously just just one piece of wire half half a wavelength long, and the bit I've called spacer. It just it's not, I mean that's a very important thing that the distance between the two and the coupling between the two which that represents is uh, is a is an important part of uh, making the beam work but you couldn't have anything much simpler so n n not only is it simple but actually you can see it's compact it's not even the uh, the not even the full length of 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 half a wavelength so um the impedance at the feed point is uh, is is 50 ohms well I'm I measured the I measured the one I just looked at in the in the uh, I just waved at you in the bag there this morning I I, uh, I put it together it was it was forty nine point something so fifty fifty no this is pretty well what it is just a few shots of of um, of what a two element moxon looks like that's a shot in um, off the west coast of Scotland and. Um, what you can see there, obviously, is is uh, is a what well, isn't obvious actually. That's an Oxima antenna. You what you can see there are the spreaders, and the wire stretches between the uh, b between the spreaders, and in the middle, there is another little pole, the short pole. You can see the wire coming down from it. That um, supports the feed line, and also it's pretty useful because that also tells you which direction the antenna is pointing if you're trying to look at it in the dark or something like that. So that's about 35 feet up and, and on 15 meters. That worked really nicely. There's a slightly bigger version in my back garden, trying to get higher than the trees. Um, that's 20 meters, same construction. The mast had grown to 40 feet, I think, by that stage. 
it's amazing. I spent a lot of time designing that mast. I'd be able to put it up from time to time, but I don't think I've ever actually done it apart from when I was building it. But I felt very pleased with it at the time because I can, I can pull that up and down on my own, which uh, I thought was pretty impressive, really, with some of my some of my general lack of competence. And there's the same 20 meter one, and that's on top of what you might laughingly call a hotel in Uganda. Um, and that's that that is pretty high up. That's the 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 Moxon's about twenty something feet, so not much on the on the roof. I was in one of the rooms on the first the, sort of the middle floor as it were. And that is that that hotel is actually on a massive mound and the mound is actually on a, a volcanic plug. So that's that's a mighty height there, actually. And um that's where I took rather to my surprise I actually came first in that. But anyway, so that's mm, that's that's, that's yeah, that's that's the same antenna, three 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 different ways. Um now you can do you can make a mox a mox in another way, and if you think about that first diagram I showed you, um, this is one made almost entirely of aluminium. So the 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 elements are the, the the kind of envelope shape, and there's an there's an insulator in each of the side sections, which is what I call the spacers, and it's supported by a boom, and that's um, in of antennas. A design. It's um, it's I've I've that's that's at home. It's in this house here on above it, and uh, it works. It does it does work very well. But it's it's actually quite heavy. It's got a very very strong boom, and it's uh, it's it's relatively heavy, but not that heavy. But it's still it's still quite compact. So that's the, so that's another way of building it. Um, but put it on the boom and make the whole thing out of uh, out of aluminium. The other advantage is if you make it out of, out of aluminium rather, rather than wire, you're likely to get to a greater bandwidth <laughs> as well. Although I don't actually think that's really a problem. I'm nearly at the end of what is slightly technical. Is it? I'm not even sure it's that. If you put a moxon on its side, you have got a vertical a uh, 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 vertical dipole array VDA. Why it's called a dipole, I do not know, because it's actually a beam. If you if you just like to put your brain to that diagram, that actually this this is also a moxon, and it's pointing that away. Can you can you see that? I'm not yes, sure. We can just about see it. So it's more or less in can the you, middle, isn't it? Your cursor. Yeah. yeah. So on the on the yeah on <clears> the <throat> yes okay. So <clears throat> on the on. So that's the uh, that that's the uh, that's the driven element there, uh, but is vertical, and the reflector is behind it, and the critical spacer, which which uh, uh, which ensures that the antenna works, is is uh, up at the up at the top and up at the bottom, as it were, and and it and it fires in the direction of the of the radiating element, obviously being a, a two element beam. And these work absolutely brilliantly if you get them near the sea. I mean, really near to the sea. And where I've used this is actually up in, again, up in Scotland. And in fact, I have a picture which shows you can just about see the wires. You can see uh, that that's firing to the right, the same as the diagram before. And actually, you can see the water behind it slightly. This was sort of towards the evening. And the great delight is that was low tide. At high tide, it actually laps underneath the antenna, and it really works brilliantly. So that's that's an that's really a moxon in in almost every way. But um, you just need to be near the ocean to make it work well. That's a bit of a disadvantage if you're in the middle of Africa, or indeed if even if you're in the middle of Kent, actually. So um, I just mentioned that because. VDAs actually are not are not that dissimilar in terms of the uh, the think, thinking behind them. So, I reckon I have found the simplest simplest thing to do is to do this kind of X shape and support the support the uh, the the elements around the outside. So. I did this. I don't. This is a terribly brilliantly drawn diagram, but hope you can you can understand it. The red, the red, the red bit is the driven element. There's a little gap in the at the top, and the purple 
wire is the reflector and you can see the spacer in between them and they are mounted on um, telescopic poles fiberglass poles which are joined to what you might call the spider the thing in the green in the middle um, and that's really all there is to it actually and the and the feeder comes up the uh, up the mast you can see the end of the mast as it were and 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 wanders off down to to the center of the of the red wire i hope that didn't sound too patronizing but i <laughs> hope you've got the general idea that is that is the basis of the antenna that uh, that i'm i'm talking about uh and that's that's really what you've uh, you've just been looking at as well so here we go I just want, I'll go through it sort of bit by bit. First of all, the size of the elements. You might say, well, obviously, well, it's true. The size of the elements is absolutely critical. Um, both uh, the diameter of the wire and indeed the length. Fortunately, if you go on the internet, you will find loads of calculators for MOX and antennas. They're, they're virtually the same calculator with various people um, having kind of <laughs> uh, claimed some or no responsibility for for having pinched them for the truth were known but um let me just move on so that's that's what you will find on the internet there are quite a number of those as you notice this one goes to some length talking about it it's all the public domain and therefore you know there isn't a, there isn't a copyright on it so that's helpful just notice that on the right hand side obviously the the shape of the uh, uh, of the antenna has been distorted and just fitted into the page. I mean, it looks just like a square, isn't it? But it isn't actually a square. It's a sort of business envelope size. And into these calculators, you can just pop the wire diameter and the frequency you want to go on, press the button, and bingo, it will tell you um, what all those lengths are. Now, wire diameter, I use really thin wire. Let me just... Uh, just going to unwrap my Christmas parcel here. Whoops, here we go. That's I think, that. Yeah, I was going to say, we'll, we'll show it, you a close-up now. If you can hold it really still for us then, Nick, then it will, it should sort of um, resolve. There we are. Yep, I think we can see. So roughly yep. what diameter is that wire that you're holding? Not, not 0.9 millimetres. So it's, oh, yeah, as you say, very small, really. Less yeah, than so, so it is quite small. The reason what... The reason is, well, first of all, weight. Um, also, my my mate told me that he reckoned you could you could make it pretty thin. Also, when I used to have the branch of Maplins, I could buy it there, which is uh, which was quite convenient. Can I just ask as well? Is that enamel copper wire? No, it, it it's um, oh, is it enamelled? Doesn't matter. No, I don't think it is. So it doesn't need. No, it's not going to touch no, anything not. else. So it doesn't have to be insulated. No, 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 it doesn't. No, it doesn't right. need. It doesn't, okay. No, not at all. No. Okay. So, so, you, so that. That's a suitable wire diameter. Uh, well, particularly at these higher frequencies, um, and you just pop the frequency and press the button, and bingo, you get a printout. That's I just remember a different program has come out in a slightly different format, but that's the that's the mm -hmm. answer I got for wanting to be on. I can't see the frequency because I've got the twenty eight oh three oh. There we are, twenty eight oh three oh. That's yeah. right. There we are. And I put one millimeter in. I wasn't actually. I wasn't actually quite sure how 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 wide the uh, the wire was at that stage. I, is that, is that, it was I mean, you mentioned this, Nick. Is it, so it's quite critical, the diameter of the wire then, to, to that calculation, obviously. Uh, well, it just it, it just will affect the velocity factor and therefore will affect the length. Hmm. So, um, yes, I mean, you can... I can't do it here live, but you can have a play with it. On, on If you go online, you can try putting a 5 millimeter wire and see what it does to it. Hmm. And uh, and you'll, you'll get nearer to the figures that are being uh, used in that in of antenna um version of the Moxon which I mentioned so that's that's the that's the that's the there's the measurements in my little bag of goodies I apologize for being in feet but I'm one of these people who's a bit I still measure things in feet and then I go to millimeters as you can see at the bottom 3.39 but what on earth's that and of course that's actually meters isn't it and uh, <laughs> the one thing this the calculators don't do is to tell you what the um, what 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 the radius is from from the centre of the of the antenna, which is what you need to know if you're going to build the sort of antenna that I'm doing. But if you remember Pythagoras, it's not too difficult to work out. Um, so 
it's the uh, the radius there is only is 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 less than seven feet so it's it's really very kind of modest and if you look look at the uh, the other measurements the measurement a which is the so say the back the, the longer side that's see less than 13 feet long b is the is the turn turned in bits as it were of the driven element only i mean less than two feet c is uh sorry not c d um yeah, two point three seven. You can't see the dot, can you? Particularly, and then uh, yes. So, as you can see, it's 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 pretty manageable in terms of in terms of size. But I'm just stressing that actually the measurements are really important. Um, mm. it, it because you, you will, you'll find it quite difficult. You realise that if you if you want to adjust the size of it, you've got to, you you've got to think about the the overall length, and you've got to think about the effect. The effect on the spacing as well so better to get the dimensions right the first time around and uh and presumably make to, life, to, to, make to make easier. it work off on on several parts of a band then you pick the maybe the middle of the band if you think you're going to move either side so you yeah well i'm the a center point i'm a i'm a cw kind of person but but uh, mm. uh yes that's true of course I'll, I'll, i've actually got a i've got a printout of uh, um of the swr Actually, which I which I did this afternoon. Um, I'll come to it in a few moments. So you can see, it's actually okay across um, across the whole band. If if you've got a built-in ATU in in your in your transceiver, which, which don't match a lot of things, but they do they do make up for this kind of uh, this kind of situation. You, you'll you'll be fine. The other thing I would mention about wire antennas, and others others may have found it as well. When they get wet, they change frequency quite a lot, actually. And you can't do much about that, <laughs> except to give them a shake when it uh, when it stops raining. So uh, it is quite useful having a having an ATU. Um, anyway, there we are. So uh, what what I'm saying really is it isn't very difficult to find out the the uh, the, the size you need. And um, I meant to put this on. I'm really sorry, but um, if you look up uh, a W4 uh, slash VP9KF. On uh, on the on the internet, you'll get um, a version of it, but you'll see lots of versions of uh, of this calculator, which is very helpful if you're a bit kind of uh, technically illiterate like me. So, um, right, those are the ten. Let me just move on a bit. Now, one or two things about making the making the uh, the antenna, because the because the corners are important where it, where it turns. Um, when you pack it away, you want to be able to find that without measuring it every time. So what I do is I just put a blob of solder on, and then when you come to tie it to the spreaders, you just put a piece of thin twine like that round the solder, and uh, and then and tie it to the spreader, and then usually um, use some ca use some cable clips to to keep it in place. So I bring you that wonderful picture of a blob of solder, but I hope you get. What I'm getting at on them, it's just to uh, it's just just to help you um, just put the antenna together quickly. It took me about uh, 25 minutes to put it together today. Now that is um, that is a spacer, so you'll know from the. If I just go back. That spacer would be uh, 0.325 of a foot, which is what is it? It's about four inches, isn't it? Something like that. Hmm. And um, well, I've made those out of all sorts of things. That's I inspected that today because I couldn't I couldn't remember what I made it with. I th I think I made it from a piece of piece of chopping board. Um, I'm entirely sure I did. In fact, yeah, people use um, those. I know for insulators sometimes, don't they? So yeah. yeah. So I just I think I I reckon I just chopped a great lump off the side, um, off, off the side of the chopping board. Because actually, the chopping board is an integral part of the vertical dipole array, but I won't bore you with that at the moment, but uh, absolutely fundamental part of it. <laughs> so I've got a few of them. So there you are. It's quite simple. You can do it with all sorts of things. If you're really stuck, you could actually just do it with uh, with an insulator and, and some and some twine. But um, that's what that's what I'm doing. You could do it. You could do it with Perspex. Um, I could hear people screaming in pain. Somebody, somebody once came up to me and said, "Actually, you know, I, I said, I was, I was, uh, 
recommending people use, use plastic bottles as insulators on the low bands. At some talk I was giving, come along, somebody came up to me and said, actually, you really can be careful about which, which type of bottle you use because of what they're made of. And I thought, oh, I'm completely out of my depth here. And that wasn't a particularly unusual experience. So Another one an, thing as well, I, I'll just share with something with you. I'm sure you've heard this before, Nick, if I may, is that yeah, we, we learned a hard lesson many years ago in this club when someone made a, it was direction finding equipment actually, and they was using, most people were using electrical white pipe, 20 mil conduit, but they, oh. uh, plastic, but you know what I'm gonna say. Yeah. When they used the black, some people said, oh, I've got black in the garage, I'll use that. And of course the black often contains carbon, which is a yes. conductor. So I yep. imagine the same might be, a, might be if you use the black plastic for this. So just be aware maybe. Could be, could be, mm. yep. Anyway, that works. Um, uh, this uh, this is this shows you what happens if you try and cut a hole through the middle of a piece of the specs. If you forget the fact that if you go really fast, it'll melt. But no. so it's a pretty pretty in, inelegant. But that's the that's the feed point. And that actually says ten on, so I know which which antenna it is. So that's the feed point, and they just you'll see they go into uh, just into a little uh, uh, connection box to uh, to connect onto the coax. Right. And the reason it's got a hole in the middle is that goes onto the pole that sticks out and just gives it a bit of support. And the cable comes along that pole. I think, I hope that makes sense. And then on the other side of the antenna, where there is also, uh, in the version I do, the, the pole, the sort of support pole sticks out both sides, I just give a little bit of support to the center of the reflector in the middle. It makes the thing look look tidy and straight and gives it a bit of bit of rigidity. Um, you don't you don't get much rigidity if you only weigh just over two kilograms, but um, I've never had any trouble with these. They haven't had them blowing down or anything. Touch wood, I haven't got one up at the moment. Right, so that was that's the wire. Now we get to the the spiders. Now this is the slightly expensive part of it, really. I suppose. Uh, how do you make an X frame to hold the wire? Um, well, all the moxins I've made have been based on. Uh, display fishing poles, so to beam poles you mentioned. Yes, they, I bought them there as well. Um, most of those are about 1.3 meters long or 1.4 when they collapsed, some, something like that. They're too long for a suitcase. That was the, that was the heart of the problem. Uh, you can squeeze them into a golf bag and they just about, you can easily get them through airports, but not always. So what I wanted was one to collapse to 55 centimetres. I switched into metric again, but 22 inches. So first of all, I tried all sorts of bits and pieces from long abandoned poles. I've got a lot of those. Soto made a lot of money way back. Um, and sort of things happen over the years to them. So I've got bits and pieces. And I've actually, they're quite, um, yeah, they're quite kind of spread around, really. I've got, I've got one in 5B4AHJ's pool house, store in cyprus and uh, there's one in the roof space of a house in western uganda and i think there may be another one in kenya anyway i've got loads in my garden shed as well but to cut a long story short it was very i find it very difficult to cut down the larger size of telescopic poles you know the the uh, the nine or ten meter versions to, to turn them into anything worthwhile out of scraps that's because when you really examine those fiberglass poles, they're actually all they're all different. If you get two what appear to be identical poles, you will find that the the telescoping section sometimes are different lengths and the thickness sometimes sometimes are different, so they kind of bind together in a different sort of way. And overall, um, I thought this is hopeless. I can't I, I, I can't do this. So I went and bought some and uh, I bought these poles. Another plug for Sota beams. Um, so I got them from Sota. They was they were they were selling them as um, super compact or something. And uh, when I got them, it said Spirit of Air, which actually is the name which I've seen on quite a number of poles I've bought from various places. So if you're looking if you're looking for a, a really short one, they are usually called uh, windsock display socket, um, and um, mm. There's, a, there's an example there. And uh, I did have to pay a bit of money for those. I think I paid almost £100 uh, for four. Um, but um, you, could, you could hunt around. I used to get, uh, I used to get poles from 
a place called Sky Blue Leisure. Um, but they, I think they seem to have disappeared. If you go on Amazon, there's still there's still quite a wide choice, but you do have to hunt around a bit to get the uh, to get the very short ones. You don't necessarily need to buy very short. I just thought that would be quite a good wheeze if I wanted to pop it in, inside a suitcase, and uh, so I saw it as a bit of a bit of a challenge. Um, anyway, so that's the uh, so I've got four of those. I'll just find one. Here we go. They come in a little plastic bag, and uh, there we are. There's another one, and they go. They they uh, in their original form, they're four point one meters, but actually uh, took the two thinnest sections out because they're too they're too thin really to support anything. But they're they're strong enough to support, I think, um, twelve meters and possibly even a fifteen meter antenna. But this is, but this is ten, as I say. Now I I reinforce them because when if you're going to um, if you're going to join them together in in the spider which is made out of um, sort of right angled you know um, aluminium I'll wave some of that at you in, in a moment you've got to be very careful you don't actually crush the uh, the, the fiberglass pole As those of you who've used them will know fiberglass poles will take quite a lot of punishment but they do not like being trodden on. And once you've crushed them, you can, well, you can repair them, but it's very difficult. But uh, really, they've had it. So I put, uh, so I just put a little bit of little bit of aluminium on uh, with a gap in it, uh, um, if you know what I mean, so that I, I can attach these to the um, to the to the aluminium support uh, with a stainless steel jubilee clip, and the the bit on the end there is to stop it from being crushed, and it's glued on quite tightly and I put two of those on two of those on on each of the poles oh there's the there's the angle aluminium I'm not sure what you quite call it but anyway quite small only you know inch by an inch um, you can get it in uh, B&Q they charge rather a lot of money but on the other hand you're not buying much and if you're only <laughs> if it's only 22 inches you're, you're not actually going to use too much either because um you only need you only need three bits, um, or another place I use. If I'm not, I'm allowed to advertise. I hope I am on this particular occasion. Uh, Aluminium Online, very good firm, and they cut stuff up for you. Uh, I, rec I would recommend that they also sell poles, incidentally, which uh, which, which uh, in, in you know interlock, which are in consecutive sizes. They're quite hard to get these days. So anyway. Um, just a few thoughts on 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 finding 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 your pole. So onto the spider. There's that's the stock we use for it. There's my wonderfully clean bench. But there you can see a long length of angle alley, and there you are, 22 inches to prove the case. And so that's going to support uh, one pole on one side and one pole on the other side. If you look in the middle where the uh, exhaust clamps fitted, you can see a line. You need to you need to mark that with a line so you know where the pole comes to when you come to bolt it on so that when you've marked up where the antenna is connected it's all the right size I hope you follow what i'm saying mm -hmm. and um so exhaust clamp they're steel you could use alley if you can lay your hands on them not they're not so easy to get actually and uh, i usually use aluminium clips because they're convenient so there you are that's just one like that there's another there's another shot there you could there you can see the marks I think those marks could be done rather better than that, really. I must have a word with my my garage assistant, as in myself. Um, so, and and this is uh, this rather exotic thing is is w what I have used, which was scraps of poles to make the support for the feeder um, and for the and for the reflector, and um, so I. I put them inside something and glued them up. I can't remember what it was now. And uh, a bit of the old pipe cladding there. They don't need to be so tight, of course, because they haven't got any, any any great weight on them at all. And there is the connector for the feed point. So the uh, little connecting block at the end there goes on to the connectors, which you saw earlier on. And I use a... Um, Ballon, a choke, a choke ballon. 
you don't need many turns. You want 10 meters here, and um, and off you go. I find that I find that's that is more. It is more convenient to have a short connector connected to your coax than try, than have a whole load of coax floating around. Just personal preference, I guess. And that's the other thing you need. You need something to measure uh, your antenna uh, antenna. Uh, impedance and 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 VSW on all that and all that kind of stuff. Just checking, I I've got ahead of myself here. Yep. Okay. So not much more to do. Come to put it together. Uh, you, you pull out the extent. You you pull out the the spreader poles. When you're doing the final assembly, I usually just tape the the, the joints where they, you know, where, they, where 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 they come together. But pull them tight, a bit of tape around them. There's there's not a huge. It's not like uh, when they're vertical, when you've got the weight of the antenna kind of pushing on them. When they're when they're holding a wire like this, there's not quite the same weight. But um, a, a bit of taping the joint stops them imploding on themselves. And um, then you assemble the assemble the spider as you can see you put the put the spreaders on the stub mast quite loosely first of all so that you can adjust them when you fit the elements and um, you also attach the pole oh I didn't I didn't didn't mention the stub mast let me just kind of show you this really somewhere in here so here's the, so here's a stub mast and So here we have a exhaust clamp. Do you know these never they never quite come out right, do they? Here we go. There we go. So that's how that looks. Okay, Nick, if you can hold it nice and still for us, then we'll... Yep. We can see. Okay, so mast. that's your long piece of angled aluminium. Yep. aluminium angle. yep. yep. And then that's that's the that's the spreader, which you line up with a line, so it's always in the same place each time. And then you fix it on with a stainless steel Jubilee clip. Mm. One, one... Sorry, I've got the wrong way around, haven't I? Like that. One there where there's a reinforcement and one there where there's a reinforcement. Right. So it doesn't okay, crush so the got... tube, as you say. Uh, the... Correct, correct. Once yes, fiberglass just... crushes, it, I've, I've never successfully fixed it. It's right off when I've done it. Yeah. So two Jubilee clips and then, of course, the other one there and you've got yourself mm. a great big long pole. And then you put the other one in the same way to make the X beneath it. And somewhere along the line, you put the the one that supports the cable. I hope, I hope that's pretty clear. Yeah, thank you. I've shown you I've shown you lots of the pictures, so it should be. I hope. Anyway, um, so you do that. Um, so you make you make the X as it as it were um, on on the uh, on the stub mast, and then um, you, you just spread out your um, your your wire. And you take them to the points on the, well, what you would have marked on the spreaders, uh, what the exact distance from the center is, according to the calculations done earlier on, put a bit of tape on to mark it. So you just move the wire to the right positions on, on the spreaders, juggle with them a bit and, uh, and, and fasten them and you've got yourself an antenna. And the last thing you have to do is to uh, connect the feed point and a um, bit of 50 ohm coax and that was how that antenna looked at three o'clock this afternoon when I took that picture on my mm. antenna analyzer. As you can see, it's fairly resonant on 28.000. Yeah, so that is the center point, isn't it? Just for people not familiar with yes, those analyzers. Yes. So that middle center if, line of dots. Yeah, if you look at if, if you look at the bot if you look at the bottom of a, of a sort of matrix, there's a little red line, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it was quite difficult to take that because it was the sun. Came, the sun came out at the right, right. wrong no, moment. We can was, see that actually. So yeah, okay. but you can you can you can see it's resonant, okay, and you can yes. see it's resonant on the on the right frequency, and that was uh, as it were straight out of the box. 
So, that, and, and actually, there you can see the SWR 1.08, um, and then 46.5. But I lied, didn't I? And I said it was 49, but anyway, it's, it's close enough to 50. And just looking at it yeah. again to put for context, it looks like so. It's a span is of that's of the whole screen would be 48 megs. Is that right? Uh, no, it span? isn't. No, no, no. It's less. No, it's less than that. Right. Uh, I'm trying to get context of I, what the other, how, how wide the bandwidth is really of that uh, before the SWR gets high. You know, I can't remember. No, it's okay. It's not critical. I just was, but as you say, um, 28 megs, that's absolutely as close as you can get 1.08 SWR. Yeah, yeah. Really good. No, you're, the, whole of the, the whole of the band is, the whole of the band is below, is below one part 1 1.3 actually so um, that's mm. okay it'll, that'll do mm. I can't I I can't remember I, this is wrong. I can't remember the, how you set the bandwidth on this apologies somebody will probably put me right in, in a few moments so I always struggle with this the trouble is you use it you use it you know these things you put them away and then you bring yeah. them you can't know which yes. button did I press when whatever I was getting a bit desperate at this stage I was getting, I was getting a bit close to uh, this evening if the truth were known Anyway, I just I thought I thought I'd like to show you that actually it uh, it, it is resonant, and that was out that only filling that was at only about ten feet, but I haven't found that it makes a huge difference when you actually put it uh, put it up in the air. So um, so what? Just a few just a few comments on that. I talked about why uh, the, the wire gauge earlier on, um, and and the effects of rain. Uh, the differences between the thin wire mox and, and the tubular one. I think the main difference is, is SWR. The 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 one the the mox that's made with uh, aluminium tubing is pretty flat actually and pretty broad banded, and that's that that obviously has advantages. Um, and the other thing I I think it's fair to say that w if you if you're looking for the best possible performance, obviously you need to be exactly on the resonant frequency, and that's particularly true of a wire antenna. You'll get about six dBs forward gain with this antenna, and front to back ratio. Well, it's it says it says on the uh, Innov antenna ones that I think it's 27 dBs. I surprised. I, I was surprised by that. I think that's that's quite good. But I've done some done some uh, real time tests on that. And I think I think that is true actually with the with that one. This. The wire one, I think, probably is, is slightly less, but it, you get you get a reasonable amount of front to back on a um, or actually on the on the resonant frequency. Um, but it's not it's it's not a this is not a precision directional antenna, um, as you realise, because it's it's actually got the ends got the ends tucked in apart from anything else. Um, anyway, I think it would be fair to say it, it it does work. How do you point it in the right direction? Well. Um, for portable use, I usually I put two guide wires on the opposite corners. You know, it's a really thin holly. Um, this this sort of stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, we'll it's just very try, actually. If you can hold that up again, and we'll try and get a, <clears throat> a bigger picture of it. Excuse me. Let me. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, it's dead cheap. I actually I I find it very difficult to get these days. I don't know why. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not kind of doing when I was in, but actually, I found a really cheap place in Cyprus, and I bought up forever. But um, uh, anyway, I just I use use that. You need two, by the way. You can't. You can't steer. You can't steer a, 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 a beam with just one. You'll find uh, it, it just doesn't stay in the in in the same place. You need two. Or alternatively, uh, you that's a, a very small Yesu rotator, which which I have. I'm not sure this will make it. It didn't used to be very expensive. They they only turn a, a lightweight beam. They're really designed for um, UHF and VHF, but um, they would certainly handle. I would say this this ten meter beam, and I have used it. They haven't got a they haven't got a break on them. They're held by by by, as well, by the mechanism. But just by the friction of the gears, yeah. Yeah, mm. by the mechanical break. But mm. if you're not doing it in a hurricane, you're probably you're probably fine. So uh, so you could do that. Um, the, so they, so there we are. Um, I surprised myself this afternoon that I, I'd, I'd forgotten that I'd actually left it. So the, the what I showed you that sort of bundle of stuff certainly would would uh, take a twelve meter 
um, a 12 meter wire and might even do might even do 15 so you could that makes you a choice of band if you want to but I was only planning for one band anyway anyway there's the principles you can play with them I think there's one more <laughs> I just thought yeah my my uh, my inner antenna which is which is on the roof I I happen to have a, bulk, a balcony in my house so I so I put a rotator actually ground level with a couple of bearings above it and that that turns a quite light antenna quite satisfactorily on 10 meters mm. and if you, and if you wrap it up in a in a bin liner it stops it getting too wet too but there we are mm. <laughs> anyway there we are very light a very lightweight weight antenna it does work i hope i've convinced you and um ever so easy to make as you see from bits and pieces largely and um i uh, I offer it to you, and uh, if you've heard mm. all about it before, I'd be delighted to hear other ideas from, from other people. And you can just go and call CQ. Thank you very much. Lovely. Any questions? Yes, thanks very much, <clears throat> Nick. Excuse me. Um, well, I mean, look at that. It is simple, as you say, and it's a beam. And did you say two kilos? I think just under two kilos is it weighed at the yeah, beginning? I think, was, you said I, think it was, I think it was 2.2, I think. <clears throat> That's really light, isn't it? Um, even... I, I even Oh, it it would it would just be a a quite small part of a suitcase full of you know what I mean. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so so in terms of of rotating it and mast and all that stuff, you you're into a different world if it's only that weight. Yes. You don't absolutely. You don't you don't you don't need two inch poles. You can have smaller poles. Um. You know where you go. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. I'm sure there might be some questions and comments about that. Um. I'm, I'm sure. So do ask them now. It's a good time to do it. Uh, if you've Do got any to... questions or comments, or if you've got any, um, obviously, as Nick says, if you've got any experiences yourself with a, uh, um, a compact um, antenna, that can work on that. Um, I was going to ask one question um, uh, before we hear from other people. Um, it, you know, specifically, that was, I think, 28 megs. Um, if you've got a, an ATU built into your transceiver, or you have one with you, how tolerant is that of working at other bands, or isn't it, really? What, what that antenna? Yeah. Well, yes. Is it very specifically no. just really no, suitable very, for very, d d No. It's, uh, no. I've, um, <laughs> perhaps uh, yes. Don't don't, uh, don't throw me the, the change of scriptures out at me. <laughs> no. No. Not only, at all. No, no, you you it's, didn't it's, say it was multi band, but I wondered. No. If... It's in, it, it's it's intended to be single band. Right. Because um, you know people say they don't get good performance on the when they first. I remember first coming on uh, on the air that there's there's you get great. Great performance with with a single band antenna, um, and uh, yes. that. I mean, and it's not compromised that's still true. in theory, is it? No, but um, I mean, I managed to with this simple wire antenna I had. It was uh, we ran um, as I said on uh, forty meters and yeah. on twenty meters, but nevertheless, you know, it was a compromise. Obviously, in the antenna tuning, although as this club we try and we mean our courses, we don't call them data use, we call them antenna matching units because they're much more descriptive of what they are. You know, at least did I say AT? Did I say ATU? That's really bad. I, I, I agree right. with what you just. I'm not picking. I up agree with you entirely. Yeah, well, this is what we AMUs. try and teach to people because they think it no, right. works magic. Right. Um, they don't. But, you can't tune. <laughs> it's no, a match. No, you just match it up and to make yeah. the, the transmitter happy. But okay, but that's brilliant. Let's have a look and see if we've got any comments or, or questions from anybody. Um, Mike uh, G4 oh, DYC says hi Nick. May many thanks for practical information and for many DX. QSOs with you, he says. So Mike, G4DYC, he's one of our Excellent. members. Excellent. Hi, Mike. Nice to hear from you. Brilliant. Um, no other questions as such yet, although um, we could have a comment. If I think this is this was actually before your talk, so forgive this out of context, but I want to mention it anyway. Gordon 2 m 0 bgk says, Scotland is fantastic for radio. Please try out the NC500 and take a radio with you as it's all, it's well worth it. Uh, also, many thanks um, to the team at DV Scotland Phoenix for providing all the Scottish repeats and those in the UK too. Anyway, Gordon, lovely to for you to join our club meeting and um, uh, just. I know, the, I know, I know the Fe I know the Phoenix group, and uh, actually, I'm 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 going to Scotland next month to do CQWW. Right, with okay. a with a friend of mine. So you'll use some of those, yeah. Thank we, you. We'll we'll be on that same bit of water. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Nick, uh, Mike has come back with a question. Uh, Nick, have you ever had any queries from airport security, etc.? Perhaps they just think you are shark fishing uh, from Mike. I've I've had all sorts of questions from airports. Um, some people seem to 
some seem people seem to get into into difficulty. But uh, yeah, if you've got all, if you've got all that gear, uh, I've always what people who asked that question before, I usually say, well, I I don't lie, I don't lie, but I don't necessarily offer a full answer if you know what I mean. Um, I don't mean, I mean, if people ask me a difficult question, I'll say yes or no or something or whatever and they say you know um they say what and what is and 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 what is this this you know had a golf bag with loads of stuff in it amateur radio stuff i'd say that's a golf bag it's true it is a golf bag I didn't have golf stuff inside but it was a golf bag so well, yeah <clears throat> i suppose it just depends on I, I guess most airport security people have been there sometimes so they must have seen all this stuff before I, I give well, the people, you... the, the, people, the people who had the, the people who said they had the, the most fun with my kit was was uh, was at Manston Airport in Kent, which is currently closed. But mm. um, yeah, my my luggage uh, got left behind somewhere. It arrived later, and they said they had such a time going through it all. They didn't know what it all was. Because well, okay. you're not there to explain <laughs> it and things. Yeah, I've not. I'll, I'll give you a tip. I'll pass on to everybody a tip, really, if I may. It was a fantastic tip um, earlier in my career when I started traveling with the little boxes and prototypes of things that we were creating uh, in my company. Um, <clears throat> and what they suggested was always try, if it's a piece of commercial equipment, to travel with a brochure or two of the equipment. Um, in particular, I mean, this particular, one of our first products was a black box with a red and green button. And you can imagine how that looked. Very small, compact, handheld box. It was a data logger actually, but it had a red yes. and green button and red and green LED. And, you know, and I never thought about it until I, yeah. I, I was challenged at an airport once and I had to yeah. explain it. And this one happened to be a prototype. but So ever after that, I always carried brochures with me of my company's products and things just to, you know, to show that what I was taking was yeah. something, even if it would, they didn't understand it. And I guess nowadays, although we'd like to think our hobby is still well known, mm -hmm. You know, amateur mm. radio, not everybody knows. And I've told, no. especially younger generations of people, sometimes they think, what's amateur that's, radio? That, that's, re that's really good advice. I mean, I, I try to put in a, a radio license. Um, I've put my UK one in, in if I haven't got one for the country I'm going to. Yes. I've got, if I've got it from the country I'm going to, I put that, put that right on the top. And then I, I usually always travel with receipts to show that I've bought the equipment and it's mine because some places try to charge you tax. And that's, yes. that, that can be a very large amount of money if, it, if things get difficult. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what is the, you, you mentioned that you, you did this project and I think that's why you developed the area for, for when you went with your friend to the Gambia. So, oh, we didn't go, by the way. Oh, you didn't go? Oh, I didn't go. <laughs> I should have that. mentioned that. No. No, we changed, we changed our minds at the last minute. Oh. No, well, he... He went. He went to do a. He went to do a, a, a recce, and uh, a, a number of things happened. But um, basically, the accommodation we put, the, the noise level was appalling, and uh, the power was the the power was was unsteady. And and in the end, we decided not to do it. <laughs> but you said before that that you were pretty yeah. well travelled, I think, and and going to other oh oh countries, yes, yes exotic countries and or yes, countries that yes. we wouldn't nation. Uh, necessarily yeah. think of for vacations. So, yeah. what's the special attraction to you to you for going to some of those countries? Like you mentioned, Uganda, for example. You know, um, what, were the, what were the special attractions of working and operating DX from there? Oh, uh, um, well, my my uh, my attraction to Africa is is not necess necessarily amateur radio. I mean, I did voluntary service overseas when I was eighteen in uh, in Sierra Leone, and but, but I got a re amateur radio license as it happens. Um, so there's a mixture, really, of of um, of Africa in a in a broader sense. But um, oh, the attraction of being there, of course, is um, if, if you're you're top of the heap and people are calling you every time you go on the air. That's uh, that's all good fun, and it's um, you do you do have to overcome quite a lot of uh, problems in order to get on the air. But um, and of course, it was with talk to you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and in this hobby where equipment now in terms of the radio and things has got so sophisticated for most mm. of us i think it's fair to say it seems you know impossible to say develop a transceiver uh with the same sort of capacity as that but of course antennas is one of those things that we still can and should make ourselves yeah. isn't it? and experiment with it's the one thing that really hasn't you know even i don't think anyway though there's been lots of different ideas and variations I agree. Of antennas, it's still something you can make yourself and not spend Hundreds of I'll be, pounds necessarily. I'll, 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 I'll be frank. I see the price that some people charge for commercial dipoles and things. I think, 
Yeah, so how, do I. How come? I mean, yeah. you don't yeah. you don't just spend all that money. It's just pieces of wire. Most of them are insulators, aren't they? Which are pennies. Yeah. Really, mm. and relatively. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. we've got some questions for you now. So I'd like okay. to bring them to you. Firstly, Jim G3YLA says, uh, great antenna inspiration, Sorry. Nick. Have you ever tried nesting another band around the outside of the 10 meter elements? Um, um, I haven't, but uh, G3XAQ has, I know. Um, and he does, and he's, he does a, what he does is just puts a, I think he puts a phasing line in and feeds them both with with the same with the same feeder and um he claims there's no he, there's no particular loss in performance i'm i'm not sure about that i'm i don't like any kind of compromise really but um it is possible it is possible i i, I would um yeah alan g 3 would would knows more about that because i can't ex exactly remember what he told me but some some bands you can nest and okay, others others you can't, and I, I can't I can't exactly remember which are which. So I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfactory answer. But uh, but it's, so it's possible to nest other bands anyway with it. It is. It is. Yes, it is possible. Good. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Slightly off the subject, but just because uh, he's one of our club members, Martin G Seven UGB, and I just spotted that he says he's watching now on BATC live from Croatia. So there's somewhere. I don't know whether you're working any. Radio over there, Martin. But maybe you'd let us know if you you'd let us know in the next few minutes. It's good. Hello, to, Croatia. <laughs> yeah, good to see that you're watching us from there. Uh, Rick M7 GMT says it's also possible to use the same construction technique to create a folded three-element Yagi, known as a Skyper. I think it is uh, approximately the same overall footprint, but a little more gain over the Moxon due to the extra element. Have you got any experience of that? Nope. No, I've never I heard of a Skype no, myself. I'd be just in that. I mean, you um, same footprint. Well, that, uh, that's interesting. That that would be quite difficult to achieve because the, the um, front 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 to back the moxon is really very narrow, and actually, and it's not a full it's not a full halfway f long either because the the ends are are, are are brought in. Three elements is more weight, of course. Um, but oh. if it works, it works. Yeah, I'd like yeah, to know. Fascinating. It'd be really interesting, Rick, actually. I mean, no, if you've got great. Any other details yeah. you can put on there. Well, those, 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 are not... who, those are of us who those of us who live with with. Um, I, I mean, I haven't got constraints about real estate. I've, I've got constraints to do with the fact I'm in a conservation area. Um, but uh, I'm always looking for ideas. Always. <laughs> well, look for a skyper then, maybe. Oh, um, Nick has just come back and said spreaders in a square rather than a rectangle. That's what he says. Spreaders in a square. Oh, that would make sense. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, well, I mean, if you if you um, if you look at a spider beam, which is a uh, it's three elements on most bands and four elements on ten, I think I'm right in saying yes. The, the spreaders there are, are 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 in a square. The only, the, the 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 one thing I found with with um, I have got a spider beam, but it's been used all my other. It's been to a number of interesting places, and usually without me. Um, but because it's because it's square, it's quite difficult to get in the air. And if if you look at people using spider beams on de expeditions, very often they've got them twenty feet in the air. With that is not really high enough for say mm. twenty meters. It's it's really it's really a bit low. But the the problem is what you do with an enormous great droopy yeah. thing that's 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 difficult. With, the advantage of the moxon is is because it it is only two elements, and you have to accept the fact less gain. Da 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 da. It's quite small back to front, and therefore you can easily put it up, push it up and down. Yes. But, um, He's come back with one other comment as well. Um, oh no, he, he just said I think it's pronounced skipper. He said so. I said skyper because he put a s k y p p e r, which might be how it's spelt, but it's pronounced. Skipper. I think I've I've seen I've seen that word somewhere. Yeah. Right. Well, that might be worth looking mm. up. And um, again, it, uh, you at home, we're coming to the end of our evening now. But if you've got any comments uh, about anything that you've experienced like this, just as Rick has, then do let us yeah. know. Got another um, uh, comment for you. I'm not sure who this is from, actually, because I think there was a problem with putting the name in to uh, BATC where he's written it. Um, but uh, there, someone has put, anyway, sounds like some good projects for the 3D printer as well. Have you used the 3D printing for any of your insulators and, uh, and uh, spreaders and things? No, I'm 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 sure the answer is yes. I'm just saying, 
I'm, I'm the not only that thing clever. I would add to Sorry. That. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, a lot of people do play around with 3D printers now, and I've played around. Yeah, sure. Tammy has as well. I think the only thing I would say is a lot of the materials, though, they can be quite brittle. And because it's made up of layers, although it's melted largely and fused together, in my experience, they can be a bit brittle. So I would have thought, if you want maximum strength, to use a solid piece of material like Perspex, as you say, ac acrylic. A tr you know, true acrylic is very strong. It, it, it is acrylic, yes. Yeah, actually, I, I said Perspex, but it is actually acrylic. And, and then that's really strong, isn't it? And tough. But a good yes. idea for a 3D printer, absolutely printing things like this. Really good. To, uh, to, to, make, to make the spider, presumably? or. Uh, perhaps I possibly, although yeah. that's big. Then. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah, but it's a good, it's a good application. Yeah. Some some of mm. our members have have been using three D printers for really good effect recently. Yeah. Uh, Rick has come back again and has given us a link to a commercial version. And I'll read this link to you, for you and everybody else watching. This is one of the commercial versions of it. It's www.pros. So I'll do it again. I'll read it really slowly. Actually, I'll start again. So it's all the W's. Tammy's now going to put it, I think, onto Facebook for those of you watching on Facebook as well. It's www.prosky.pper. That's oh, prosky.pper.com, that is. So thank you for that, Rick. Something okay, thanks, great Rick. to be able to share things. Look forward to having a look at that. That'd be good. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Nick, it's been fascinating. I was just one other point. I, I made a note when you through your talk that was interested me. Generally, I guess a comment. You you said there was. I think you said there was a greater bandwidth if you used aluminium instead of copper at one point. Is that and, right? And, 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 and not that's not to do with the material, of course. It's it's. Uh, I'm you're using a 0 0.9 millimeter as opposed to about okay. what what did five or six millimeters probably yes. something like okay. that okay so it's yes. the size of it again that was critical not, yes. not the actual material yeah. i just wondered if there was something in that but anyway many many thanks nick for joining us again pleasure um I'm, i hope this one hasn't been as fraught as the journey when you came to norfolk and, that was okay uh, it was only a joke <laughs> no of course but i mean i hope you'll come and see us again one day as i said we yeah. do do most of I'd our talks that. like this because we can uh, you know all of our members from which we've we've uh, We've also got some extra members that are coming from well outside Norfolk, and yeah. of course we welcome them. So it's lovely yeah. um, to have welcome them. Uh, one other qu last point, by the way, just someone's just put uh, Mike uh, G eight E Y has put DX Engineering call the handband Skyper or or a oh call the handband Skyper or Skipper a spider beam. So maybe they're almost one and the same, possibly. Maybe. I don't know. DX That's what Mike has put. Spider beam? I, don't I mean, know. DX Engineering are a big film. retailer in the States, aren't they? So um, They're very good. Yeah, too. Possibly. All right. Yeah. Anyway, lovely. Thanks for all your feedback at home and many, I, many I should have, I should have uh, apologised also for wearing a headset. We had, we had troubles with the with the sound. So Yeah, we did a little check earlier on, um, which we don't always do on the day. And it's a good job we did because of, I must admit, the first time yes. when we spoke to you, we just couldn't hear. But it's been absolutely fine with the headset. My, uh, Nick, so thank you very much indeed. It's been good. I've enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, lovely yeah. to see you again. Take okay. care. Yeah, you on the air. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Certainly. Thank you. There we are. Good to see Nick again uh, sometime since we saw him. And uh, thanks very much, of course, to him for coming on, giving us the talk tonight. So, just uh, to, to before we go, to let you know again what's happening this week at NARC on Sunday, we've got the GB Terras News on GB3MB at seven o'clock with Mike. Uh, on Monday night, the 7.30, we've got the Monday Night Net on GB3MB. Uh, at 8 o'clock, there's the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And I've just thought of something I could mention actually here, of course. We've also got Tonight at 8, which is an RSGB yeah. production that we do every month for them, a webinar on a Beginner's Guide to Contesting with Lee Volante. So if you're interested in that, we'll put the details in this week's end's newsletter. That's on Monday night at 8 o'clock as well. Uh, on their BATC and uh, YouTube channels. And then f uh, next Wednesday here in a week's time, October the 4th, we're at CNS School with a social and bright sparks for our younger members. And then we're back here in two weeks time for NARC Live on the 11th of October with a talk on the Sable Island de expedition live with Glenn W0GJ. And don't forget to keep sending us your pictures and your stories, we love to see them and any uh, mystery items that we can fox people with for our competition we'd love to hear from you but that's about it for now so from Tammy M0 TC bye bye and from me David G7 URP bon voyage 
and we look forward to seeing some of you next week at the club. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.